Hello and welcome to the first episode of a six-part mini-series of the Aronex podcast, focusing on the story of the industrial life cycle. No one should be unaware of the drive to increase sustainability, to push forward the greening of society and the many industries that support our societies and to decarbonize our lives and the processes, those processes that support us. Now in this mini series, we'll be looking at the life cycle of an object, a fuel, a ship, of a soap that you can buy online or in the department store. This mini series will bring together how growing pressure to understand the impact on the environment of a product or service is over its total life, how it needs to be determined and how this is going to impact our lives. My name is Craig Eason. I'm editor of the Fathom World website and host of the Aronex podcast. And I'm Rasmus Elsper Jensen, owner and CEO of Reflow. Um, we are a company focusing on uh, helping companies around the world to uh, work more data driven in their uh, climate efforts and, and working a lot with life cycle assessment. More so, besides being the CEO of Reflow, also the EU Climate Pact Ambassador. So, with Rasmus's help, we're going to look at life cycle assessments and how this is impacting the industries. I've got a strong focus on the shipping industry, of course. So Rasmus, I want to go to some basics, if I can, with you now. Over the mini series, I'm going to talk to a lot of people. There's consumer product manufacturers, a B2B manufacturer, a ship owner, a shipbuilder, a financial expert, a regulatory expert, as well as a researcher into fuel life cycle analysis and shipping. And we're also going to hear from an analyst looking into the future. So you're the guru of the two of us. So I'm going to be using you to clarify, you know, where this story is going. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's going to be super exciting and, and calling me a guru. That's just uh, amazing. I hope I can uh, definitely um, uh, help out with the clarification. But it's going to be super excited, as you also mentioned. We're going to, at least today, look into a environmentally conscious consumer brand. Um, and what I'm really looking forward to is to hear a little bit about how they started their, their journey. And, and really, on many fronts, this company is, is ahead of its time. So here we're going to see and, and hear about why their motivation is to work with the LCA, hopefully. Um, but also we're gonna we're gonna hear a little bit about today and on, on how to uh, what are the challenges to become data driven with all the the climate efforts looking at incorporating life cycle assessment and there are there are some challenges for many companies uh, on how to work with data and hopefully here we're gonna hear um, from another company uh, that are working with with LCA to see what are their challenges and also um, what are the motivation behind it. My name is Robert Smith, and no, I'm not from The Cure, but I've been, I've been working with the green transition for many, many years. And Robert works for House of Cosmetics in Denmark. Which is a brand that no one really knows. Uh, we are a private label producer, uh, and in Denmark, people will know one of our brands. It's called eCooking. I'm responsible for the, the entire ESG package within eCooking. So it's a, it's, it's a kind of a complicated uh, role I have here because I'm employed by House of Cosmetics, but I am doing a lot of business development for the brands, which is more than just looking into the environmental impact of the products. One of the reasons I wanted to hear from a company like House of Cosmetics is because they're starting down their journey to do an analysis of the life cycle of their product portfolio. Something that Robert Schmidt admits will not be easy and it could take a long time. I haven't found any cosmetic brands that are doing proper LCAs today. Uh, I know of various brands that are using kind of templates that you more or less you can download from the internet um, for having you know, just an indication of what is the impact from, from our product here. But we have a new owner in our uh, in our board here, which is uh, an investor group, uh, which means that <clears throat> now we are not a, a middle-sized company anymore. And it also means that uh, already this year, we will have to report on our uh, CO2 emissions from our production and our, um, our business. 
So this means that they'll be building up reports on each and every one of the products that they sell. But we actually decided to be the first brand that will go into deep with this, trying to find out what are the exact impact from our products. And will that be a, a sufficient tool for us in order to make decisions on new suppliers, uh, other sorts of ingredients in the coming new products? Uh, and of course, this is on a test level as it is because we just started doing the LCAs and it will take a lot of time, but we have we have a, a decision and we made it pu public that we will make LCAs on all our products. So it's not just, you know, one or two. We will do it on all our things. Uh, so it is a, it's a project that will that will take a few years. Um, but uh, but I think that as soon as we will we will be more public about the results, then I think the customers will start asking our, you know, co-brands or other brands in the market, what what are your LCAs? What are the impact of using your product? And I th and I hope that the customer will, you know, just not just be satisfied with the very simple answer, but they will actually require some sort of documentation. So Schmidt feels that once his company has begun to demonstrate how his company is going to measure the life cycle, the emissions, the footprint of their products all across their product chain, that it's going to empower the consumer, that's you and me, to put pressure on other brands. And I think this is surely a powerful message of how the environmental picture of a product can buy in, well, can buy in the stores, can influence and create change. But I also asked Robert about how far back he thinks a company needs to go um, and even forward in estimating supply chain emissions, including shipping. His company needs to assess things like this. And his answer gives an idea of how companies look at LCAs and may then see change to their shipping needs. It's a very good question. And and that's also you know, always, you know, the typical answer for a question that you cannot really give us a solid, quick answer to. Um, one of the challenges we have in our business here is the that the supply chain is not transparent. Uh, just to, to make it very clear, if we buy olive oil, uh, it has taken us many years to find a supplier where we can buy directly from a farm in Italy, where we also can be provided with all the certificates and so on that we require. Usually you will buy on a market full of agents that are buying from various suppliers and they're mixing all the oils into a big bulk and then you you simply buy maybe 1000 liter of oil and some of it are from Greece some from Italy some from Spain so it's in in this regard it's really difficult to um, to calculate uh, the exact impact uh, from it when you don't know how it has been produced, how it's been transported, and so on. And the data gathering here is, is you know, very, very difficult. It, it's difficult to do these LTAs uh, in, in a level where you can actually compare product to product. I see a trend in other businesses that I hope will um, will mirror itself into the cosmetics uh, business within some years. Uh, for, example, for example, in the IT business, I see now that a lot of the, when you go down the supply chain, uh, there is a demand for carbon uh, neutral, uh, neutrality, what do you call that? It's, it's just that you require that the next level in your supply chain is carbon neutral. So you don't, and the reason for this is basically it's it's a desktop assessment, so you don't have to bring them into your scope three because you could say when you, when you do your calculation, if you have a carbon neutral supplier, you don't need to make any calculations. So you don't need the hassle of gathering info. So it would be so much easier for me to, to tell uh, or require from a packaging supplier to us that you have to be carbon neutral. If, if you want to 
sell us your product, you have to be carbon neutral. And then it's that company's responsibility to put forward that demand down his supply chain. And I think it will come. It will happen. So that would be the easiest way for us to handle the supply chain. If we could just go to the nearest supplier and say, this is the demand that we put forward to you. And then we expect you to put the same demand forward to your next supply in line. So that's Robert Schmidt from House of Cosmetics, a Danish company most of us would never have heard of, but is a big part of the cosmetics industry in Denmark and in Europe. Now, it tells you a little bit about the, this interest uh, within the consumer market that's growing here. Rasmus, what it, say, it says to me is there's going to be building pressure across the supply chain. And particularly when it comes to this scope three questions, we keep on coming up about this now, don't we? We hear a lot about scope three and for the shipping industry, for any company involved in uh, supply chain um, logistics or transportation, these are the companies that provide or are the scope three emissions for companies like uh, Roberts. Yeah, that, that's true, Craig. And I think uh, scope three emissions, um, what, is, what, is, what is scope three emissions? And um, there is a lot of talk about scope three emissions. And as you mentioned, this is also where the shipping industry falls in under that category. So scope three emissions is also called life cycle emissions. And basically all the emissions in regards to the, uh, or to the, to the um, supply chain of, of your product. Is it, as Robert says, are going to be a complex thing for companies to actually measure? One, one of the things we heard him say there was their requirements could well be, we want you to prove that you are carbon neutral. We don't need to have all of the data from you, but we need you to prove that you are carbon neutral. Is, is that too simple an ask for a manufacturer to ask of a um, a shipping company or somebody who's providing transportation services. I think first off, let's talk about the word carbon neutral. Uh, we hear a lot of companies, including shipping companies, using the word carbon neutral, that they want to have an ambition to be carbon neutral. And I think when you use the word carbon neutral um, and you combine that with life cycle assessment, it is very, very difficult to actually prove that you're carbon neutral. And that's simply because the scope three emissions or the um, supply chain emissions will always emit something. You will always have a spend of emissions somewhere in the supply chain. So it is, first of all, when a company says they wanna be carbon neutral, let's just bury that one a little bit. Um, you, can, you can work towards becoming um, greener or less carbon uh, uh, emitting um, in your products, but to call a carbon neutral product. That is typically what we see companies are doing when they're focusing only on one life cycle stage. That means one area of where their product is emitting. And that's also, um, for example, with the cars, you will say you have a carbon or emissions free product or carbon neutral product. Well, that is simply because they're only focusing on one life cycle stage. But when you're focusing on the entire, uh, all life cycle stages, it is nearly impossible to have a carbon neutral product in, in many ways. So asking a company to say it's carbon neutral is, um, it's an impossible ask because they're really not going to give you the right picture then. What should we be asking companies to demonstrate? I think um, I think what companies really need to do now is to start uh, creating uh, data. As we can hear from House of Cosmetics, uh, they have a challenge in getting data from, from their suppliers and their supply chain. Um, and I think that is definitely one of the biggest challenges that we see right now is to get the data uh, from your supply chain. Uh, if it's shipping companies or it's ingredient manufacturers, you need to start producing data, but also transparency in where you get your data from. And I think that's really, really important. So you're able to use tools like lifecycle assessment. You will, it will require data from your suppliers, definitely. And that's that's a challenge. And we see that not just with House of Cosmetics, but that's a general problem. And that's really something that will take some time for uh, companies to start becoming uh, more used to providing this kind of data. So that, that's why it's going to it's going to take so much time. And that leads me actually quite nicely into Tim Pedersen, Viking Life Saving Vice President. He's responsible for sustainability and quality issues. I spoke to him because they have started this process. If we take a, a simple uh, 
uh, life journey for, for one of our products. Then it all starts with raw materials. Uh, that could be steel, that could be rubber, that could be different other raw materials that are then uh, 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 purchased by Viking, distributed through one of our uh, global manufacturing sites. Once it has been manufactured, it's again distributed into service, so basically being brought on board the, the vessels or the offshore installations or wherever it uh, saves and protects lives. Uh, and throughout the uh, lifetime, uh, it also undergoes regular maintenance and that requires spare parts until it, uh, at the end it ends uh, its life. So either at a disposal stage or at a, a recycling stage. Despite us not that we haven't, uh, you could say, fully completed the collection and digitalization of these millions of data yet, uh, we are already aware that uh, some of the material categories we are utilizing are those having a relatively high CO2 footprint. That includes steel, that also includes uh, GRP, and it includes uh, other uh, sorts of, of, you can say, plastics and and. Uh, uh, different other uh, elements. So uh, without knowing the exact size and scale of uh, uh, of, of the uh, specific CO2 uh, impact for, for each of these, we have already initiated uh, uh, an exercise where we are exploring how we can make it greener. Can we introduce a greener sort of steel into our production? Can we introduce a, a are there a greener solution to, uh, to, to GRP as examples? So uh, we are in that process uh, at the moment actively. Uh, in addition thereto, we are also uh, looking into our uh, footprint, footprint in a much more detailed manner. That includes uh, that we are evaluating if we can uh, uh, to some extent partly or in full neutralize uh, the power consumption of our manufacturing sites. Uh, and that is a true uh, utilization of uh, solar panels and also true, uh, 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 you could say, a more green approach to how we manufacture products in, in general. That was Tim Pedersen from Viking Life Saving, which makes the immersion suits, lifeboats, life rafts and other equipment that can be found on ships and offshore installations. And obviously part of their analysis there is looking at how they can maintain the equipment as well as manufacture it in, in the long term, getting the data to manufacture it, but also to maintain it and renew it and then to recycle it. So tell me, Rasmus, when you're looking at that kind of picture, Tim there alluded to the fact that they've started the process they've already identified one or two ways that they can make improvements but he has clearly sort of got a long journey ahead of him to get all of that data what kind of data do companies need to collect is it just co2 emissions from various things insular co2 emissions or are we looking at a lot of different types of data yeah, I think I think for for the um, what we hear from Tim from Viking Life Saving is uh, basically a company that are taking a different approach than many others because what I hear Viking is doing here is they're really saying okay we need to make our homework before we can make change so the approach that Viking is taking um, is that they are now starting to collect the data they're starting to collect and understand their scope of emissions. Um, and then from there, they will also get an overview of where do they have the highest emissions, but also on their products. So in that way, uh, what you could think they will be doing is basically uh, looking at where do we have the highest emissions and then put a decarbonization strategy in place there. So they don't go around and start a lot of projects in the blind. Um, so that's that's really amazing. But the kind of data that they're looking at, what they really need, um, from what I can hear Tim is explaining here, that is the um, the data or the, um, the the products, uh, all the ingredients, all the materials that goes into producing their products. So this could be, uh, as we heard here, immersion suits, lifeboats. So what are basically, what is the bill of material for each suit, each lifeboat? How does that break down to materials, power consumption? What are the life, um, what are the logistics involved with each of these products in its manufacturing and so on? So this is this can be a quite an undertaking, and that's why we recommend using software to assist with this because it can be, um, it can be a lot of data to have in a spreadsheet. I think it's going to be interesting to see how they how they build up that data. And one of the things through speaking to the experts that I've begun to realize 
is it's not about making absolutely everything um, carbon emission free or CO2 free, is it? It's about having the data to rationalize the best approach Definitely. In, in different avenues. Yeah, exactly. So it's about getting the data and understand your emissions and then afterwards put a strategy in place. Um, because in that way, you get more bang for the buck. You you pretty much will you will know what it will take to lower the emissions because you can also make s- simulations saying, what if we exchange um, a virgin steel with recycled steel from a certain supplier? Then you will be able to do the simulation before you buy it so you're able to see it. And I think this is really... Uh, going to be an eye opener for many companies uh, because today what we typically see is there is a lot of companies out there that are investing in a lot of green initiatives without really understanding the effect on their products. Uh, here we could, for example, um, I've, I've seen companies that invest in solar panels or other types of renewable uh, power sources for their factories, but they have no idea if it's really uh, doing anything good on their products because they don't have enough data to assess it. So this is really um, going to be a game changer. I'm sure it's also going to be a game changer from from Viking when they get further on the process, because now suddenly climate impact is something that they have numbers on and can really assess before they do it. Um, so it's not just the blind projects. And it was interesting. He was talking all about the, the number of customers of his that uh, they have that are beginning to take an interest. These large companies are going to their suppliers and asking, have you got that kind of data available? Yeah, they're really growing a lot of interest. And I think from, from Viking Life Saving, they're, they're also a large supplier to ferries and cruise ships. And we're seeing a lot of attention on the cruise industry. The Actually, the, the, the areas of the maritime industry that are closer to the consumers uh, is where we see the most uh, pull right now from the consumers to have uh, an idea of your your climate impact. And this is from the cruise industry. So I'm, I'm very sure that some of that impact that Viking is seeing right now, Viking Life Saving, is, could be from their cruise segment where they're really trying to, to get a good idea and basically aligning their supply chains to provide that kind of a data. So going forward, I think we will see that uh, many of the, the larger ship owners closer to the end consumer, if it's container uh, vessels or it's cruise vessels, they will start demanding or aligning their supply chains to really be able to produce um, a climate data on, on the products as part of the procurement process. So this is really super exciting and it's really positive to hear that a large company like Viking Life Saving is already starting to see the request going forward. In our next episode, we're going to look at the financial elements. Uh, To do this, I've spoken to Peter Secker, who has been a sustainable expert in the financial institutions for many years, including with New Credit Sustainable Solutions. When mom and pop comes into the bank, uh, we will have to ask them in the banks, do you want uh, green or black investments? And uh, Interestingly, the ones I've, you know, spoken to, uh, we are way above uh, 95%. All investors want green investments. And what's driving the EU taxonomy is uh, the investors, because that's where you have the law and regulation. Uh, the green taxonomy is not made in the way that you prohibit black products. So any cement producer or shipping company, they can sell black, uh, that is high emitting uh, products and services. It's not prohibited. But the green taxonomy is about making money flow into green, sustainable products. So more about the financial markets, the EU taxonomy and how ESG reporting and life cycle analysis and assessments may not be ideal bedfellows in the second episode of this special mini series from Fathom World. And Reflow. My name is Craig Eason, owner and editor at Fathom World and host of the Aaron Exit podcast. And I'm Rasmus Selsper Jensen, founder of Reflow. And you're listening to a special series of the Aaron Exit podcast, looking at the growing need for all to understand life cycles and life cycle assessments and the things and services around us.